One of the key issues that Australia faces in the Asian region is how we balance the interests of our biggest trading partner, China, and our most important ally, the United States. And nowhere is that potentially a more difficult question than in the South China Sea, where dozens of rocks and atolls and islands are the subject of territorial disputes and where the United States challenges what it calls excessive maritime claims with freedom of navigation operations. Operations which the US President says he would love Australia to join. So tonight, we tackle that question head on in a joint project with the University of Melbourne and the Wheeler Centre with a hypothetical crisis in the South China Sea. What happens if American and Chinese maritime forces clash in disputed waterways and Australia is called on to come to the aid of the United States? How far would we be prepared to go? You don't have to look very far to understand the importance of the South China Sea. Every year, ships carrying more than $3 trillion worth of global trade navigate its waters. And more than half of Australia's coal and iron ore exports pass through it. And if you were in any doubt about its economic significance, take a look at this video from China Central Television. It's one of the most important and busiest shipping lanes over the planet, with over 40% of the freight from the globe passing through this area. The number of oil tankers entering the South China Sea through the Strait of Malacca is three times as high as Suez Canals and five times as high as Panama Canals. But the South China Sea is not only important for its shipping lanes, it's home to some of the region's richest fishing grounds and potentially vast fields of oil and gas. Malaysia claims territory along its coast. Brunei argues for its own patch of the contested waters. The Philippines focuses on the sea to its west as falling within its purview. Vietnam also stakes a significant claim. And China relies on the so-called Nine Dash Line to assert sovereignty over around 90% of the sea. China has also undertaken an extensive building operation, turning rocks and reefs into artificial islands. The United States challenges what it calls excessive maritime claims by conducting freedom of navigation operations, sailing inside 12 nautical miles of disputed territory. The US uses ships and surveillance planes to make its point. This is Chinese Navy. United States military aircraft conducting lawful military activities outside national airspace. I am operating with due regard as required under international law. You are approaching my military security ear. Please go away quickly in order to run tournaments. Your action is unfriendly and dangerous. This exchange happened near Fiery Cross Reef, a key focus of China's island building. It used to look like this. In more recent years, it looked like this. And here it is at the end of last year. It may be a speck in the ocean, but the reef is claimed by China, the Philippines and Vietnam. And it's China that's turned it into a key strategic facility. Fiery Cross Reef is at the centre of tonight's hypothetical. So to introduce our expert panel this evening, we have at the end of the table Professor Chen Hung. Chen is a director of the Australian Studies Centre at East China Normal University in Shanghai and tonight he plays the role of the voice of China. Next, we have Dr. Meriden Varrell, the director of the East Asia Program at the Lowy Institute. She's also a former policy advisor at the UNDP in China. And tonight, Meriden plays the role of Australia's ambassador to Beijing. Professor Admiral Chris Barry is the honorary professor at the ANU in Canberra. He spent 42 years in the Royal Australian Navy, and uh, that included four years as Australia's chief of the Defence Force, a role he will reprise tonight. 
Next to Chris, we have uh, the Honourable Gareth Evans, Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, Chancellor of the ANU, former head of the International Crisis Group, and of course, Australian Foreign Minister in both the Hawke and Keating cabinets. Tonight, he's going to play the role of both Foreign Minister and Acting Defence Minister, and given the world that we currently live in, it means he is serving under a Liberal government. <laughs> Next to Gareth, we have Sam Moston, a senior company director with a career that spans business and politics and philanthropy and also sport. She's the former president of the Australian Council for International Development, and tonight she plays the role of business leader. Dr. Saki Tok joined the Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne in 2012. He got his PhD in International Studies in the UK. He's also studied and worked in Singapore. And tonight, he plays the role of Australia's ambassador to ASEAN, which is the grouping of the 10 Southeast Asian countries. And beside Sal Keat at the end here is Dr. Charles Edel. Dr. Charles Edel is a visiting scholar at the United States Studies Centre. He's formerly of the US Naval War College and uh, he also served as the US Secretary of State's policy planning staff for two years in the lead up to 2017. Tonight, he plays the role of the US Secretary of State. Please welcome my panel. So, to our hypothetical. It's a blissful summer's day, clear skies, gentle waters. The United States naval destroyer, the USS Decatur, is undertaking a freedom of navigation operation through the disputed territory in the South China Sea. He is sailing just inside the 12 nautical mile territorial zone of the Fiery Cross Reef. There are three Chinese vessels that are shadowing the Decatur. This is not unusual. You've got two Chinese Coast Guard vessels and you've also got a Chinese frigate that's just hanging back a little. The Chinese have repeatedly warned the Americans that they are uh, basically violating China's sovereignty and they should leave the area immediately. There's a game of, of cat and mouse that's going on. Uh, and in essence, uh, some of the ships are getting just a little too close. One of the Chinese Coast Guard vessels cuts across the bow of the US destroyer. The destroyer attempts an emergency stop. It's called a crashback in Navy parlance, but it doesn't succeed. And the Chinese Coast Guard ship is hit. The vessel starts to sink. Its crew of 45 are either dead, injured, or in need of rescue. And the US destroyer is also severely damaged, and it also has a number of casualties. The news takes just minutes to reach Beijing. Chen Hung, what's Beijing's initial response? Well, I think China is uh, indignant about this blatant act of aggression, which has caused a uh, loss of life of Chinese seamen and also assets. And China condemns such uh, cowardly acts in which uh, the American fully armed warship, the uh, destroyer, uh, intensely, you know, uh, uh, sank a Chinese vessel which is unarmed and non-military. So China retains the right to, uh, 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 to, resort, uh, to the right to resort to uh, measures of retaliation. China has uh, called the U.S. ambassador in Beijing and uh, uh, to lodge a formal protest. That is why actually China believes this kind of act, act or aggression, which has been resulting in the loss of life and the loss of uh, Chinese property and assets as a kind of blatant uh, act of uh, invasion in Chinese territory and sovereignty. And if we go back to Fiery Cross Reef, obviously there's an immediate uh, rescue situation mm -hmm. that is at hand. Mm -hmm. Are you also uh, keen that the American destroyer doesn't leave the area, even if it could? We don't know how badly damaged it is. Uh, China first actually will uh, very resolutely demand uh, the uh, USS uh, Decatur to uh, remain, uh, well, the uh, vessel per se, and also the crew, to remain in the exact scene of crime, 
So this is China's initial response, of course. That phone call to the American ambassador hasn't uh, flowed through yet. And what we've got is an emergency situation with the US Pacific Command in Hawaii. And PACCOM in uh, Hawaii is very quick to contact the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Also, uh, of course, the US Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis. And they advise that the US aircraft carrier, the Carl Vinson, has just left port in the Philippines. And it has been directed to go to the collision zone. But it's some 15 hours sailing away. PACOM has also advised that the closest non-Chinese vessel at this point in time is the HMAS Ballarat, which is an Australian uh, Navy frigate, and it's just returned from exercises with Japan and happens to be in the area. So Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defence, rings you, Charles Edel, as the uh, Secretary of State for the United States. What's your initial response? This is a high-risk situation where the first priority is to rescue and recover and make sure that we account for as many sailors as we can. I was just going to say, if that demand that the uh, destroyer not leave the area, even if it could leave the area, and we're not sure how damaged it is at this point, if that demand has been relayed to the captain of the US destroyer, uh, what would the immediate response be, not at diplomatic level, but uh, at fiery cross Reef level. Well, in terms of uh, acceding to the Chinese demand that the ship go nowhere, it seems that the ship can go nowhere right now. Uh, but I, what I would say is that is not the immediate concern, and that would be addressed to the, this is a military to military communication at this point. Uh, we expect that the Chinese would handle this very professionally, uh, as we've been doing joint training exercises with them to avoid just such an incident. But at this point, the highest priority is to rescue lives that are in the water. Well. It's your job, it's been allocated to you yes. to ring the president, because unlike your predecessor, Rex Tillerson, you actually get on very well with Donald Trump. <laughs> and you dial his number, he picks up the phone, and of course he, like you, is not happy with what's happened in the South China Sea. He wants the aircraft carrier there yesterday, but uh, you can't speed that process up, it will take some 15 hours. He also agrees that the Australians and the Ballarat should be asked to help. Now, Trump knows he doesn't need to get personally involved, but he's just celebrated 100 years of mateship with Australia. He gets on very well with Malcolm Turnbull. So he decides he is going to make the call. Donald Trump rings Malcolm Turnbull and explains the situation and the fact that America would like the Ballarat to make a, a very quick detour. And when Malcolm Turnbull hangs up, Gareth Evans, he rings you. You're the acting defence minister and also the foreign minister. Do we send the Ballarat? Well, first reaction is to say, Christ, how do we get involved in this one? Um, <clears throat> but since we are, let's try and untangle it. The first need is, obviously, to address the rescue operation, and that's the first responsibility of every ship and from whatever nationality and whatever alliance relationship to go to the aid of those in need of rescue. So the instinctive reaction, of course, is to accede to that and get to the scene as fast as we can and help as much as we possibly can. No, no issue, no argument about that. But right from the beginning, I'd be asking questions about the ultimate responsibility for this occurring. Uh, was this an exercise in rank stupidity on the part of the Americans to do something provocative and indefensible, or was it a legitimate innocent passage operation? Were they engaged in surveillance activities, for example? Did they have the helicopters, the, end, the radar out, uh, which is incompatible with innocent passage in a, in a 12 nautical mile zone? Uh, or were they just genuinely flying by and only responding to the issue of not wanting to give permission and not wanting to ask permission or to ask, you know, to access? If that was what it was about, that's a defensible position for the Americans to be in. So, but that's the sort of question I'd be wanting to ask right at the beginning so that we don't get ourselves caught up in another one of these situations of whither thou goest, there we goest, and we get, the, uh, we get to pick up the mess thereafter. Well, you would know, as Foreign Minister, you don't always have possession of the full facts when you're called on to make no. a key strategic decision, and that is the case in this instance. However, However, uh, the Americans have made very clear from the outset that this was a freedom of navigation operation under innocent passage, which in essence means it is a, a non-threatening movement. There is no surveillance, there are no radars on, and they are going from point A to point B across the reef. But what I'd be doing is calling Charles pretty quickly and saying, listen, buddy, 
um, we do need to understand where we're coming from on this. Of course, we're ready to assist in every possible physical way, but there's going to be potentially much larger consequences in this. If somebody stu does something stupid on either side, if your boss decides to overreact to something that he hears on television or whatever, we might have a major explosive situation on our hands, and we've got to be very clear about what our basic position is at international law. Um, so if you don't we're, if we're going to be able to handle this. So I'd, I'd be having that conversation with Charles pretty quickly, I think. So you don't ring your head of defence? You don't say... Oh, sorry, of course I'd be asking Chris Berry. <laughs> <laughs> Being a very consultative kind of a foreign minister, as I was, and not jumping to any conclusions. I'd, I'd, be saying, I'd be saying to Chris, just what exactly are the rules, Chris, about innocent passage? And what Chris can will... you encounter? What, what would yeah. you tell me? Well, I think it's very clear under international law the right of innocent passage demands that the vessel carrying out innocent passage is not acting in any provocative way. So navigation radars are fine, but weapon systems radars are not fine. Uh, no, no use of armaments uh, and that kind of thing. So but, the vessel but quite is... regardless of that, we've got people in the water here. We've got injured people, well, we've got dead people. Once, once, you, once an accident has occurred, every means would be employed to recover people from the water and to secure the security of the ship, to, to, get the, to get the damage control position sorted out. So the Ballarat's going? I, don't, I think uh, the commanding officer of Ballarat would feel compelled to go. So indeed you're correct. The captain of the Ballarat, under the laws of the sea, the need to render assistance to a distressed vessel has indeed gone. They've come very close to the collision zone and they're almost about to cross the 12 nautical mile territor territorial sea marker around Fiery Cross Reef. Chen Hung, do the Chinese just wave them in? Come on in, this is a rescue operation, please help. I think in the first instance, China will declare this area, Fiery Cross Reef, which in Chinese we call it Rong Su Jiao, uh, to be a no entry zone. Any uh, 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 means of passage, uh, mean, uh, means of transport or personnel uh, shall not enter this area uh, unless they get prior official approval from, from China. And uh, any party uh, providing assistance or support to the invading US warship will be regarded as uh, abetting uh, the uh, invader and will be regarded as and treated as hostile. The rules of the road are fairly clear. Um, while there are uh, bodies and people in the water, I think it's every vessel within the region to participate, irrespective. That's the international rule of the road, and that's what we uh, obey. Well, let's ask China. I mean, obviously, you don't want to come to blows this early on. You've still got a rescue operation. Could you think of a way around this, perhaps a, a, a small uh, diplomatic solution that would allow the Australians to come in? They've got excellent equipment and they could be of use. Well, China have got, uh, has got uh, excellent equipment too. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, of course, definitely China wants to uh, uh, have the problem solved. China does not uh, promote confrontation military or non-military. So can you make so a suggestion in, to the Australians? So in such a kind of situation, I think actually maybe the Australian side will be contacting China first instead of calling America because you're entering Chinese waters claimed by, by China. So if you can uh, start a kind of a more diplomatic way of solving the problem to be contacting Chinese governments so that actually China can make a response. Excellency, if it helps to defuse the situation, to get that ship there quickly and to start de-escalating a situation which has the potential for one unholy amount of escalation, I think I'm prepared, without prejudice to future situations of this kind, I'm, I'm prepared to formally ask your permission, Excellency, to go in there on the understanding that if we do ask permission, you will immediately grant it and that won't inhibit the passage of our ship. Can I assume that? <laughs> So indeed, the Ballarat goes in and they join the rescue effort. Fortunately, the seas are calm, but it does take a period of time before those that can be rescued have been rescued. And in the end, you have some uh, Chinese personnel who have ended up on the American destroyer, some American personnel who have ended up on one of the Chinese Coast Guard vessels that's still in the vicinity. And the Australians have also picked up some injured Chinese. China is 
continuing to uh, be insistent that uh, the Americans can't leave the area, even if they could leave the area. And indeed, they have, through diplomatic channels, called this a crime, if I understand correctly from your earlier comments. There are a number of Chinese vessels that have been assisting in the rescue, and they are surrounding the Decatur, the US destroyer. Charles, what happens next? Do you, for the sake of resolving this, just say, OK, our people will come ashore. They will answer for this? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, what we do is we try to resolve the situation. Of course, from the very beginning, not only would lines of communication be open between the United States and Australia, but immediately between the United States and China as well. So one of the things that we would be communicating, I imagine, from the very outset is, you have said that there was a crime. We do not yet know the circumstances of what occurred there. So what we want to do is make sure that we can assist everyone who is there, no less the ships. We have no long how long they can stay afloat for. There's plenty of time for any type of fact-finding commission, but this is something that we have a solution to right now. How does that solution look to you? Well, China still insists that actually this is Chinese waters, so actually, uh, and also this is a scene of the crime. And China will take measures to uh, 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 carry out due investigations, you know, and process the, uh, the uh, situation. Let me uh, bring in, uh, I suppose, the other players in the region. Gareth Evans, as, as Foreign Minister, you no doubt would like to hear what some of the regional players are saying. As you made the point yourself, this uh, reef is actually claimed by uh, three players. Saki Tok, you're Australia's ambassador to ASEAN. What, what's the view in the region of what's going on? Well, in the first place, I think, um, Philippines or Vietnam have no assets in those areas. Um, they only have observation posts far away from Fury Cross Rift, and uh, um, probably is, is something that is come to, uh, if, if Gareth has a chance to give me a ring in the first place, um, I'll He's be very like, consultative, he's already yeah, made that I mean, point. A bit sour on the fact that, you know, this <laughs> Philippines has a claim on this, slide, on this rift, but no, nobody actually brought them into the picture. I think if, uh, if this was relayed to uh, the, the Philippines president, I think the first, first reaction will be that, you know, why are this all happening without us knowing? Yeah, that will be the first, that will be the first reaction. And for Vietnam, I think likewise. And uh, the, um, the point of contention here is, should Philippines be involved, Philippines and Vietnam be involved or not? And uh, I think the first reaction would be, no, they were not one. They want a de quick de-escalation of the matter. They want everything to be brought back to the uh, negotiating table, the diplomatic negotiations to go on. Um, and they want both sides to stand out as quickly as possible. That would be my, my message to, to Gareth. Uh, but when you give that message, I wonder what sort of uh, force is behind it, because how successful has ASEAN been as an organisation? I mean, some 15 years ago, you made steps towards uh, putting together a code of conduct for the South China Sea, and I think you're still in uh, uh, initial talks, not even negotiations. I mean, this seems to be a subject that, uh, as far as ASEAN is concerned, is just best to one side. Yes, indeed. I think, um, well, I have, two, I have two roles here. One is to explain the ASEAN side. The other one is to represent um, Australia's interest in this matter. Now, from the ASEAN angle is that they have a code of conduct as far as they're concerned. All right. Um, the, the initial or the, the, the undercurrents behind, if they have a sense of what is going on in, in the Fairy Cross Rift at the moment, would be that America is crossing the line. I think that would be the first reaction. Um, the, um, the, the rescue mission should carry, should carry on as normal. But um, other than that, um, they would say that, um, well, it goes back to the thing. There is no way of challenging China in this way. All right, Everybody just step down and let us talk. I think that would be ASEAN's position. From Australia's perspective, I would say that you know, ASEAN really doesn't have any club whatsoever to act as in concert with each other. So you've just done yourself out of a role on this hypothetical, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's OK. So while we, we still have got, uh, obviously, diplomatic moves in the background, but just to complicate all the conversations that are going on, there happens to be a television news crew that is on the USS Decatur. They're doing a, a lovely story on a day in the life of the American Navy. 
they have filed pictures of the immediate aftermath of this collision. They've got pictures of the damaged decateur. They've got pictures of injured American and also Chinese sailors in the water. These pictures are beamed across the world. This is an international story. It doesn't take very long for markets to respond. You've got stock markets having a pretty serious wobble. They're down around 4 to 5% in the initial stages. Sam Mostyn, you're a senior business figure. How worried is the business community? You're just looking at these headlines, you're looking at these pictures. It's clearly very early days, but how worried are you? Well, as the markets are telling us, with the wobbliness in sentiment, we're getting very worried. But interestingly, um, with the benefit of former leaders of our Defence Force and former ministers, business with exposure to the region, um, particularly investment and trade, has already started to scenario plan this over recent years. And it's within, the, it's within the, the confines of the kinds of issues that business has predicted could happen. So this is, uh, there's much more disaster recovery plans that business have considered and have actually started to have conversations with like-minded business leaders all over the, the world, but particularly in China and America, through the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue, through the Australian-China Business Council and other informal back channels. So um, this didn't come as a surprise. It's been it's it's within those those range of, of potential issues, along with other things happening north of us. So we're not surprised, but we are getting alarmed and and very nervous about what just how fast this is escalating. We've seen all of the the social media coming through. The Chinese community in Australia is seeing it. We've already um, had a strong feeling through our businesses that the, the local Chinese community has been nervous anyway about Australia's escalating discussions about relationships with the U.S. and who, who, who's the better friend? And so um, business is standing ready, but is probably starting to talk through the back channels and the soft diplomacy um, to get messages back to the foreign minister, the, the acting defence minister, the prime minister. But also to your counterparts in China, absolutely. counterparts in America, uh, just to try and reassure people to lower the tone? Well, to say that there must be a de-escalation path that doesn't just rely on the, the stories we've, we've just heard already. I think um, there'd be a number of people in the Australian business community and those in China and America who would know the, the new vice president for the economy and financial issues in China, um, Liu He who actually trained at Harvard University. Um, he's well known to a number of senior Australian and, and American businessmen. He's been at Davos this year having discussions. And I would I'd imagine that what has already been happening with a number of my colleagues in business is they've, they've posited this very issue about what happens if and can we call you Again, can we have that discussion? Can you operate in Washington? He could be in Washington right now having those discussions uh, with American business leaders that we could be tapping into. But certainly the soft diplomacy um, channels would be opening up and we'd be seeking to get that message very clearly to the military and, and diplomatic personnel. And, and Chen, the fact that this is now a global story, does that uh, change the way China approaches it? Yes, I think so. Because actually, I think actually news will uh, get into China quite quickly. You know, uh, friends, you know, will send messages to friends and through WeChat, through other means of uh, communication. So that actually internally, China, uh, the government won't be actually keeping a lid upon such a kind of important issue like this. And China will already have been uh, uh, making its uh, uh, stand, stand standpoint quite clear. Uh, I think actually there will be some uh, mass protests against the U.S. invading, you know, worship and also Australia. Uh, some uh, people will be protesting that uh, uh, about to the government that the Australian ship should not be allowed into the uh, waters, and uh, Chinese sovereignty should be, you know, you know, even even more resolutely, you know, uh, defended. So actually, uh, some even call Australia a lackey of uh, a running dog, you know, of uh, of America. And in this instance, you know, uh, the government feels really, you know, feel press pressured, you know, at, at this uh, situation. So if actually uh, Australia is behaving to be too pro-American, not neutral, as we first actually set as the precondition of uh, the entry of uh, the Australian vessel, then Australia will easily become a target, you know, from the mass protests. Well, let's bring Australia's foreign minister yes. in. Mm. Yeah, the trouble is, while we're putting soft messages out, while we're being conciliatory about seeking permission to go in, while we know that immediately our business community is responding through its own channels to get soft messages out, we're getting hard messages back. We're still getting very hard messages back. I talked to uh, our ambassador in Beijing and asked her, just what are you hearing uh, from the senior Chinese personnel you're talking to. How far are they going to push this and what is it going to take to begin to settle this, to calm it down? Right, well, I mean, so what do you tell me? 
if we're seeing we're seeing mass protests, and we're seeing this this going over um, Chinese social media. It means that the the government is prepared to let it flare up. You know, they could clamp down on it if they wanted to, and they're not. So they're going to. And, and what you were saying, Chen, if the government is feeling pressured, this is a pressure that they're allowing themselves to feel for political purposes. So they're they're ramping it up so that they've got what would appear like less negotiating room when it comes to, to making decisions. They're making, they're making this into a, a harder, tougher situation. Not necessarily to be ramping it up, but I think actually China, I mean, the government will stop, you know, the expression, popular ex uh, uh, expression of the sentiment. So that actually uh, the reason, the fact that actually China is not actually uh, trying to stop such protests actually indicates a kind of attitude. Yeah. Okay, let, let's yeah. bring in America here because, of course, uh, America, you've got a lot of social media in America as well and your markets have been affected and these diplomatic talks are still going on in the background. But what's the mood in the U.S.? Well, I would say that the mood is uh, increasing anxiety. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I would also say that senior officials, if you can believe it, are getting out there to calm the situation. Uh, I would also note, though, uh, in part of our calming efforts, we would point to the fact that we've just heard from the Australian ambassador uh, that this is something that the Chinese can turn on or turn off in terms of the social pressure that they are feeling. And the fact that they are escalating this and giving themselves less diplomatic wiggle room is an escalatory situation because we are continuing to calm this. I'd also note just for the business community, that is feeling concern. Our business community is feeling concern as well. But we are also quite concerned to make sure that markets don't go further south by giving way to the principle that certain zones of the seas can be closed on the will and whim of particular nations. The law of sea does, says nothing about that. And I feel like we are getting to a point, as we would, add, uh, as we would be advocating, that this is becoming an escalatory issue that is going to hedge on much larger issues where, again, I would ask my Chinese friend, we have a solution in front of us. So the question is, do you want to solve this now or do we want to escalate this? Because this is up to you. Now, but before China can actually answer that, you've got another problem. <laughs> this uh, international news story, of course, has been on Fox News. <laughs> Donald Trump has been watching and he's seen the pictures of the damaged American destroyer, the injured American seaman, and, of course, the injured Chinese as well. He picks up his telephone, he opens his Twitter app, and he types, this is bad, send in the jets, and it's all in capitals. <laughs> now, at the Pentagon, the Defence Secretary, Jim Mattis, confirms with the President that what he actually wants to happen is for the F-18 Super Hornets that are on the aircraft carrier to do a flyover, a flyby, a show of support for the injured decateur, if you like. And they can do that because the aircraft carrier is sufficiently within the range. So, Charles, as Secretary of State, has that just made your life that little bit harder? Well, we now have more issues at stake and more players in the game, so of course this makes it more challenging. I would simply say that uh, with jets all capitalized, uh, the good thing about jets all capitalized is that they can actually get eyes on the scene quicker than helicopters could being launched from that aircraft or P3s or P8s. So I would say to my Chinese friends, you see the jets coming. We are alerting you to the jets coming. They are flying by and leaving to see if we can get eyes on what is happening in the water at this time. Well, given that, Chen, well, how does China respond? Has, uh, have the jets uh, been launched or, you know... The, the jets, have, have uh, they, by the time yeah. the conversation is had with you, the jets yeah. actually have been launched. And I should point out to you that if you look at the, uh, the range of the Super Hornets and their top speed, they can actually get there in about 20 minutes. So they're there. OK, China, China will be warning the United States uh, of the serious consequences of uh, any further acts of aggression like this. But would you put your own jets up? You've just deployed Definitely. a number of Definitely. jets to yes, Woody Island. Course. I think actually China will be actually, uh, uh, well, uh, in response to uh, further uh, provocative, you know, acts by the uh, United States, China will definitely be uh, sending uh, China's own jets in the, from the nearest facilities in this area. And uh, the uh, purpose of those jets will be to expel the, uh, the presence of the uh, uh, U.S. jets, and uh, China will definitely, resolutely be defending its airspace. Jets flying cat and mouse in the air is a very dangerous business, uh, as we've seen in the East China Sea. Um, I think that is a, a potentially escalatory situation for which another miscalculation could easily occur. 
So uh, when one says uh, we're going to stop those other jets from doing anything, my serious question would be how? Uh, and that's a, an answer you would like because the only way I know how is to actually fire on them. And so I think there's potential for this to escalate. I do wonder whether the Ballarat, having recovered both Americans and Chinese people from the sea, might start to de-escalate by simply starting to transfer the American sailors back to their ship and offering the Chinese an opportunity to have their sailors back in their ship too rather than keeping in the Ballarat and indicating how this should really work. So, so just before we, we get your Foreign Minister's response to that, I think the ASEAN ambassador is quite keen and has, has made a call. Yes. Um, in fact, it was relayed to me by the Secretary General of ASEAN that um, um, things are getting a bit out of hand without participation of any Southeast Asian countries. Not forgetting that they are these waters are still claimed by, by uh, Philippines and Vietnam. So, so can you have a role with the US or with Australia or with China? Can you put forward a, a I potential think, I think that's my role. I'll probably give a quick ring to, to, to Gareth and say that, OK, there are, there are uh, national, nationalist uh, demonstrators in, in, the, in, 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 in Manila and uh, Ho Chi Minh City right now. OK, um, the, uh, the President of Philippines and the uh, sec Party Secretary of uh, uh, the uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam Communist Party have called in the uh, ambassadors of the United States, Australia and China to, to offer okay, a, a position to say that we have to put everything down, okay, set everything down, rescue the people out, and we can deal with the rest later. Please do not try to escalate things any further. Mm. Uh, for, for America, I guess, this does show the difficulty that some in the, uh, the, the administration and some of the American institutions face dealing with a president who doesn't always play by the rules. Well, that's true for any president because, the, as, they, as Harry Truman once said, the buck stops here. Look, he didn't have Twitter. Uh, <laughs> so this is a, a new exercise in diplomacy that all of us have to engage with. Uh, that said, as we have pointed out already, uh, jets are coming. That doesn't mean that jets are going to be engaged in hostile actions. OK, and indeed in our scenario, the jets are not at this point in time, although, of course, there is always potential engaged in a hostile action. So, Gareth Evans, let's take it back to Australia. And how well placed are we at this point to perhaps propose a solution and to play mediator? Well, that's exalting us a bit as a mediator, but we're there on the ground. We do have good relations with China. We do have good relations with the Americans. And I would certainly be on the phone now to both my state council or foreign ministerial excellency, Chen, and certainly uh, to my counterpart as uh, Secretary of State, uh, Charles, saying to Charles in particular, for Christ's sake, you guys must know that this is totally unhelpful, totally counterproductive. What can you do to hose your guy down? I know it's not your responsibility. You're a smart guy, buddy. You're, you, know, you don't want to be in this military overflight business any more than any of us do. But please, for God's sake, get the message that I'm getting from my ASEAN ambassador, all our ASEAN colleagues get the message that this show of strength in response is absolutely not helping. And we do have to find some formula between us that will very, very rapidly de-escalate the situation while preserving our underlying positions. And I'd be saying the same to, uh, to Chen, my Chinese colleague, uh, saying, you know, can you please recognise that your rhetoric about crime, invasion, all this stuff has contributed to escalating the response on the other side of the Pacific. Can you just stop using that kind of language and get into a dialogue with us about what we can do to find a formula that will resolve this? It's early days in identifying the formula, but that would be the message at that stage. What do you suggest as a way to, uh, as Australia can do in this kind of uh, conundrum? Well, what I guess I would be thinking at this stage and needing to test it with my ambassador in Beijing and with the Americans and others, what I'd be thinking is, from my experience in the Cambodia peace plan and so on, previous incarnation, that some form of face-saving formula has to be found for the Chinese side. Something has to be on offer from the American side which will give the Chinese a reason to step 
back and then move to a situation of putting the personnel back on their respective ships, going home and then working out later who's to blame for the actual accident. And I think so, uh, we, and what we that have... Well, I think we so I'd be asking Charles, here. have you got a formula in mind? Because that's what we need, old buddy. We Absol need a formula. No, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, not only do we have the outlines of a plan, but we have an opportunity for everyone after a very unfortunate incident to play a role in stewarding and making sure that such actions don't happen again, which means an internationally cooperative role, which means that we have the Chinese in the area, we have the Australians in the area, we have the US on the way, and we have even some of the other ASEAN nations, including the Vietnamese and Philippines. There is a solution here where everyone gets to play a useful role moving this forward and de-escalating this. This is exactly what we're looking for. Before I get you to articulate that potential solution to China, let me ask China how well-placed Australia is to play a helpful role. We might physically be there in Fiery Cross Reef, but relations are not great between China and Australia. Certainly, if you read the media, it would appear that Australia has been put into the diplomatic deep freeze. I mean, do you look fondly upon Australia as a potential helper in this situation? It is exactly in, under this, uh, against this background that I think Australia can do something to show that actually Australia does have a kind of goodwill towards the improvement of our bilateral relations, in particular at this time of crisis. I think actually Australia can be playing an important, uh, an important role. China recognizes Australia as an active player in the Asia Pacific region. China also values its uh, trade ties and educational ties with Australia and in various other areas. So China has been very much disappointed and bewildered last year uh, about uh, the deterioration of, of our bilateral relations. And uh, the uh, involvement of uh, Australia in this crisis that we are now in can turn out to be uh, two possibilities. You know, one is actually a further deterioration if Australia becomes actually totally purely you know, pro-American and supporting the American side. So, so Chen Hong, let, let's, let's the US Secretary of State uh, be in contact with China with mm -hmm. their best offer on the table. We've got obviously an ongoing rescue in the sense that there are some missing sailors from both sides still in the water. But in essence, everyone is trying to de-escalate. But you need an offer on the table. What's the offer on the table from the American side? The offer side? on the table is we're going to resolve this expeditiously. And we still, our ship is not there yet. The Australians are there. It is up to you if you want the Australians to take the U.S. sailors to the U.S. ship. So, if the, so you think the, uh, uh, by, by, by expeditiously, you mean there's this expedient in which uh, Australia can play a role? I think I'm getting a phone call. I, I'm, you're, I'm going to get a phone call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to give you a phone call. Charles, it's not helpful to talk in generalities about resolving the situation expeditiously. Of course we want the personnel transferred, and of course we're willing to help in doing that. Every sister, cousin and aunt in the region will be willing to help. But what is going to lower the temperature? What's going to stop China retaliating with further, over, you know, further aircraft operations? What's to, what is going to calm the situation enough on the Chinese side to avoid further stimulation and provocation to your policy makers on oh, your so side? Gareth, and Charles, I, you. Charles, I've been thinking about this, buddy, and I think the only way... <laughs> Sorry, I, I think the, the only way you can move this forward is for the US right now to say to the Chinese, we are prepared to acknowledge that this collision was not your fault. It was, we're, we're prepared to acknowledge it was an accident. We were doing our innocent passage. You were understandably just there protecting what your claim to sovereignty is. You didn't mean to cut across our bow. We haven't investigated this. We're not in a position to make a judgment about it, but we are prepared as a matter of putting something on the table, which is a face saver for the Chinese, I'm suggesting to you that you ought to think pretty seriously about doing just that. We do not yet know the facts at hand. That is a secondary matter that we will get to in due process and due time. We welcome the Chinese, the Australians, and the Americans participating in this. We welcome the Chinese participating in this just with the US. But that is fine to say we are not here to apportion blame at this point. So, so would you be prepared to make a public announcement that uh, this is an accident, a terrible, tragic accident, and let's all hand back our respective... I think you have to be crew. very careful with language at this point because you want to be very careful about setting precedents. So I think uh, the suggestion that we have gotten from our Australian friends is perfectly on pace. I would just nuance the language a little bit more and say that 
we are prepared to announce that what has happened has been a horrible uh, event that we do not want to ever happen again. And at this point, we're going to take care of the lives of the sailors in the water. Meanwhile, I think in China, there have been further mass, mass protests. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, the uh, people have been demanding, actually, U United States government to be making a public apology for the loss of life. So they're actually simply to be admitting that this is purely an accident. It's not like a road accident. You hit someone, you know, and then it's an accident. Even when you hit someone on, on the road, you have to compensate. You have to apologize. You have to be processed legally. So in particular, your military vessels in our waters and hit our non-military vessels. There's precedence to this kind of thing. Um, we know about um, what's happened. With, we know about what happened in the past with uh, in the, the US bombing of Belgrade. We know about the, what happened in Hainan in, in, over China in 2001. And, and we should point out for the audience that over Hainan in 2001, we had uh, two a, a US aircraft and we had a, a surveillance aircraft and we have a Chinese military aircraft and they crashed. And the pilot of the Chinese aircraft was killed and the crew of the American aircraft made it safely to Hainan Island. They were held for some 10 days and finally released after an apology by the United States. Right. And in both of those cases, there were mass protests. Um, these mass protests were allowed to continue until, in the, in, the, in the Hainan Island case, this letter came from the US, this letter of two apologies. Now, the difference is now that we've got Xi Jinping. This is not Hu Jintao anymore, this is Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping has just extended his presidential term, or the presidential term, which may be him, um, for outside of 10 years. He is making his population anxious with that, and he has a point to make. He has to demonstrate his leadership. He has to prove that he is the boss of China in a good way, in a way that's going to uh, uphold his legitimacy. So I think what we can do here is try to appeal to China to show, allow Xi Jinping an opportunity to show that he is the great leader of a rejuvenated China, not through uh, grandstanding, not through uh, inflexibility, but through benevolence and statesmanship and showing leadership in, in that kind of way. And I think we have an opportunity to try and influence in that direction. If we can get them to just call off the media a little bit to calm things down domestically, if we can just get America to tone it down a little bit, we have a space to bring Xi Jinping out in a more positive way. And Chris Barry, as Head of Defence, you've got a lot of experience behind you. Do you like what you're hearing there from the Ambassador to Beijing? Gareth Evans filled you in. Did you think that that was wise words? Well, it might. Um, uh, the first point to be made here, of course, is the international rules of the road don't uh, just disappear because you happen to be in some disputed zone. So there will be issues about who should have given way to whom. There will be issues about how this accident really occurred. And we know the United States has not had a brilliant record in the Pacific Ocean of keeping a good lookout and making sure it didn't hit other ships. Uh, and we also know that the Chinese play, they have played cat and mouse. And, you know, going back to the aircraft incident, I was sitting alongside the vice chairman of the CMC at the time it occurred. It's a Chinese and military commission. And I can tell commission. you, mm. he had no idea that this was going to happen. So. Again, you just never quite know uh, how these things unfold. But I'd go back and say um, the idea that the Australians might say to the Americans, here are your sailors and you're dead, and to then the Chinese, here are your sailors and you're dead, and, and show that the brotherhood of the sea actually works might be some way of trying to de-escalate the situation. Well, well uh, Chen, uh, let me bring China in here. So that's actually happened. You've not been able to stop that. Australia has played this role of trying to be conciliatory and has handed over the respective seamen. What do you need for you to call this an accident and to call it over for the time being? What does China want from America? I think first, actually, we, uh, well, we first will express our thanks to uh, our Australian mates for, uh, for this kind of uh, willingness to mediate. So that uh, really shows you know, Australia's active role, as a proactive role, as it can play you know, in the region, in particular in this problem solving and crisis solving. So second, of course, we uh, will be you know, sort of like discouraging uh, popular protest. And uh, the uh, people will trust the government to have the capability to solve this crisis and uh, we'll have confidence in the government. And uh, then 
uh, the uh, Chinese government will still demand the United States to make an um, apology and compensate for the uh, losses. That's actually the uh, uh, one demand. So let, let me ask America, is there, I mean, compensation for the losses is an issue that can be sorted out later, but is there a way that you can frame an apology that might be acceptable, or is apology a word that is just out of your... Well, apologize for what? I mean, there is an international principle here at stake about nations unilaterally closing down open seas. This is not something that would be stated publicly at this point. But we do not apologize when we don't have all the facts in. Actually, I believe I heard that from my Chinese counterpart as well. So at this point, I think we can frame an apology saying that we all collectively mourn the loss of life, and now we're going to get on with this. And would that be sufficient, an apology for the loss of life? Uh, I think actually even uh, anyone who is in my position is willing to accept that. Actually, the people won't, won't accept that. Well, I thought you just told yeah. me the people were willing to accept when you turned down the volume just a little uh, bit. But people are not puppets. They are not zombies. You, know, can't, you can't really shut, shut, shut them up so easily. So, so, so still these di diplomatic negotiations mm -hmm. are obviously ongoing, and we seem to have hit uh, a little bit of a, of a stalemate. Business is still heavily involved in back channels. What's happening from the, uh, from the business leader's point of view? Well, I think it's gone further than back channels now, and we're now talking about global corporations that have stepped up there, not behind the scenes discussions, but are very active. These are global leaders. They are global Chinese companies, global American companies. They control most of the social media infrastructure, whether it's, it's Facebook or it's, its counterparts, and they're making it quite clear that there, are, there must be new ways of solving things in this globalised world. They may be appealing to the, the great sports heroes of, of China um, who, who are making their, their name in soccer and basketball to say, we have got to find better ways of having this discussion. So I think the business leaders at the global level will be trying to be as creative as possible to try to find some break in the tension about what has always been done this way because of the military and, and diplomatic channels collapsing in, in this way we've seen but to try to save face using the modern world of people who carry messages about how a globalised world will have to act. And it might seem perverse that it's, um, it, it will be artists or, um, or sports people that represent their nations, but as global citizens that can step in and start to say to these leaders, guys, you've just got to find a way. And this is the old way of doing things. We know that what you're now playing with is catastrophic to the world's trade relations, to our future prosperity as a globe. It's, we're no longer playing with the Australia-China or US relationships. We're putting a lot at risk. And the second and third wave of consequences is not worth this fight in these terms. So figure it out and try to save face on both sides. And indeed, figure it out. Coming up with a solution that gets that American damage destroyer out of the area and gets everyone's people back to where they should be. Not easy. Gareth Evans, do you have the winning solution? Well... We can only try, and I'd begin by going back to my American colleague and saying, de-escalate the rhetoric. China's not closing down the open sea, to use your phrase. It is insisting on sovereign rights over 12 nautical miles and insisting that any ship travelling through that territory be genuinely engaged in innocent passage. You know and I know, Charles, that this is a deliberate exercise by the US in testing the waters and testing Chinese resolve. And as such, it's not like steaming down the open commercial channels. It's, I'm totally in accord with your judgment that you're within your rights as a matter of international law, and not just because we're an ally, you're right. But nonetheless, we have to de-escalate the situation. You've got to de-escalate your rhetoric. And you ought to be prepared. Don't use apology language, don't concede to that. But you ought to be prepared to acknowledge that this we're totally prepared to believe this was an accident and um, we'll just need to restore the status quo and get back to dealing with each other normally. It was an accident. We're acutely sorry about the loss of life on both sides. You can use the sorry word in that context. So having had that conversation, let you think about that. I would then be on the phone to His Excellency Chen and saying, you guys have got to calm down your rhetoric. It's just not helpful using still the language of crime and aggression and international law and demanding apologies. Just as everybody's got to accommodate your needs to save face, if you're demanding that the Americans give up that degree of face and give up that much of their position, they're not going to exceed. And we're all in deep doo-doo as a result. So please, just de-escalate on that side. I think I can persuade the Americans to use the acknowledgement of accident language, and I think this will probably solve it. Can you go back to your boss and try and get authorization to do that? Calm it. Can you suggest it to... Uh your American friends, well, 
the American friend uh, part, uh, side yeah. uh, about expressing sorry for the loss of life. Sorry for the loss, absolutely. Sorry for the loss of life and acknowledgement that this was an accident it wasn't a result of deliberate behaviour on either side. It was one of those things that just happen at sea in volatile, difficult environment. It just happens. You resolve it as best you can. You acknowledge the, the horror of the loss of life involved. You acknowledge how serious the issue is. You're not diminishing it in any way, but saying it's an accident, let's just get our people back together again and move to the right places and move on. And I think given the sort of thing that my ambassador was telling me about Xi Jinping's position and wanting to modify a little bit some of this authoritarian image he's developing rapidly internationally by showing that he can be the benevolent statesman in this situation, I think you've got enough then from the American side to, uh, to make you step back and for the Americans knowing that you'll step back to to be prepared to use that sort of language. But, Chen, you just had a very persuasive phone call from the Australian Foreign Minister. What's your response? My response is that actually, of course, China agrees to, uh, with Australia's mediation, you know, to be discussing a kind of like a, a version of a statement. But an apology for the loss of life? China will still be, be demanding an, an apology uh, to apologise for the loss of life. Just so you sorry. Actually, I would come in here at this point and say I think it... It is a great opportunity for both of us to add simultaneously, because we have both dead Chinese sailors and dead American sailors, for us both to come out at this point to calm down the waters, calm down the markets, and jointly issue a statement that we both mourn the loss of life. Yeah, and, and Chris Barry, you're, you're looking a little anxious there as you've been listening to the proposals being put forward by your foreign minister. Um, the, you know, look, if the formula works, I think uh, that's great for this occasion. But I don't think anyone should... Uh, misunderstand. Uh, miscalculations in these situations are going to occur. And, uh, you know, we've been chasing for over 15 years now an opportunity to have a regime to manage these kinds of issues. And only, only months ago did China say, we're now going to talk to the countries in the region bilaterally to try and develop a code to deal with these kinds of situations. But playing cat and mouse is a dangerous business, and it sometimes goes wrong. Uh, but uh, in this situation, who knows where the real blame lays? I know that American naval ships are pretty powerful, and they can pull up really quickly if they have to, because I've, been, I've served in two of them. Uh, and I think on this occasion, the watchkeeping crew and the decateur might bear some of the blame for this uh, collision. Hey, they Clearly, there are an enormous number of issues that need to be resolved between the two countries. But in terms of de-escalating the immediate crisis that we have that is rapidly threatening to spiral out of control, does America and China together agree to make a joint statement to the effect of it being an accident and then you pursue military inquiries yeah. and mourning yeah. the loss of yeah, life? Of China wants settlement of uh, all these issues and will try to ensure, make sure that no such things will happen, incidents will happen in the future. So that actually China will, uh, is happy to uh, discuss with the United States through Australia's mediation to, uh, to for, for of, of course, first for a draft of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this joint statement and also the uh, uh, further uh, processing ways of processing, you know, this, uh, this issue. China's happy to do that, of course. Absolutely. You're happy as well? Gareth Evans, you're happy? Well, if we don't resolve it this way, we won't be able to end this hypothetical on time, will we? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can always rely on a foreign minister to assist you with wrapping <laughs> things up. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. We seem to be moving towards some sort of uh, arrangement, if I can put it that way, but clearly there are many outstanding issues, and I hope we've given you some understanding of the complexity of the challenges that Australia faces in this region. So please thank our expert panel, and thank you for watching. <laughs>